Okay, thank you. Uh, so I would like to start first with thanking the organizers, of course, for uh, inviting me here. It, it's my first time in India, so it's uh, really nice to be here, in this wonderful uh, location. It's very special. Okay, so today I will uh, present our recent work on a new triangular lattice antiferromagnet, namely neodymium heptatantalate, uh, which we found that it's a new representative of a spin liquid. As I will show you, there are Ising correlations between nearest neighbors on the, on the spin lattice, and the state remains dynamical uh, to the lowest temperature that we can reach experimentally. Okay, but before starting with this, let me thank the collaborators on this work. In particular, my uh, PhD student, Tina Ar, uh, who did uh, the majority of work that I will present here. Also my uh, good colleague, uh, Matej Pregel and Zoran Kojagicic from the Josef Stefan Institute and the University of Ljubljana, where I also come from. Then special thanks also goes to Panchalan Kuntia from the in Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Uh, this is where the samples were synthesized uh, by him and his studio, student, obviously. And uh, thanks also goes to uh, various local contacts uh, to various uh, large-scale facilities where we did our experiments. Uh, this includes the ISIS facility in UK, ILL uh, in Grenoble, and also the high magnetic uh, field lab uh, in Tallahassee, Florida. Okay, so but first uh, let's, uh, let us look at frustration maybe from a slightly different perspective that you are used to. So let's say we ask ourselves the question, can you feed four adults in a tuk-tuk? Yeah, so maybe let's spice it up a little bit since we are in India, right? So let's say it's happening in downtown Bangalore, which means that there are of course a lot of tuk-tuks, but all of them are occupied. Yeah, and let's spice it up a little bit more Let's say there is heavy rain, which means even if there, are, there is some empty tuk-tuk, it, it won't stop really because of the rain. Okay, so for the sake of the argument, let's say these individuals are Carlo, Yasir, Abris, and Andre. So what would you be your answer to, to this question? What would you say? Well, the answer is, of course, you can do it, but there are buts, of course, a lot of buts. One of them is that it may take a really long time, like hours, to get a tuk-tuk or to, to fit these adults into tuk-tuk. And uh, the next but is uh, it may take a really insanely large amount of trials to do it before you can actually succeed. Okay, so uh, this uh, is, I guess, somehow related to the question whether one can fit uh, three Ising, Ising spins on a triangle. Yeah, so it's a similar question, let's say. So now you have antiferromagnetic interaction between these three uh, spins, and you try to satisfy all the bond-bond uh, interactions. Uh, in this case, it turns out that it cannot be done, so it's a harder problem than the one that I introduced before. So whatever you do with uh, these three spins, you always end up with at least one of the bonds not being satisfied. So this would be the red bond. Uh, and out of the uh, eight possible states, six of them have the energy or have the ground, uh, are the ground state, have uh, one of the bonds which is not satisfied, and the others are. Okay, now if we extend this uh, to a lattice now, triangular lattice, uh, again, Ising spins on triangular lattice. So this is the problem that was uh, worked out already in the 1950, uh, which is far, far away, right? And this was done by Vanier. And uh, he came to the conclusion that, that antiferromagnetism cannot fit on such a lattice and that there is no phase transition really present in this uh, particular model. And he even estimated actually the uh, entropy of the ground state. So there is exponentially large number of spin configurations which all have the same ground state energy. And uh, he basically calculated already the corresponding uh, entropy. Uh, if you look a little bit closer to this, uh, so uh, the ground state actually turns out to be any configuration which has either uh, two spins up and one down or vice versa on every triangle. Yeah, and this gives you then the energy of the ground state. Uh, now, this uh, configuration that is shown here is a special one, especially in the sense that there are these uh, encircled spins, minus spins, and these spins are special because they have 
three neighbors which are pointing uh, to, let's say, minus negative direction and three which are positive, okay? So if you change any of the spins from minus to plus, the energy wouldn't change, yeah? And since there are no neighbors which are encircled, this means that these uh, sides are independent of each other. So you could independently change the orientation of, of any of them. And this gives you the idea, of course, that the number of such possible uh, configurations that you get by turning uh, these states uh, is exponentially large. It increases exponentially with, with the system size. And this gives you basically the uh, macroscopic degeneracy. There's, there are also more, co more complicated states in the ground state manifold, but these are, uh, this, is, uh, this represent a big majority of them. Uh, as I said before, there is no long range order in this uh, system, but actually it turns out that uh, the correlations decay uh, according to a power law. So it's a critical spin liquid. And it's a classical spin liquid, of course, because we have a classical model. We don't have any quantum uh, fluctuations in this particular model. Okay, then let's go on to the so-called XXZ model. So what we introduce now is uh, uh, quantum corrections or quantum perturbations in the perpendicular direction to the uh, Z direction. Yeah, so this is this delta term that I introduced. I'll be focusing on the case where delta is a small number. So we have really a small perturbation to the icing, icing case. In this case, the question is, of course, what is the ground state? Yeah, and what one should do is basically compare uh, the classical state, which is the state for S, uh, which goes to infinity, and uh, quantum mechanical state, right? So for the classical state, it turns out that the, uh, uh, so if you fix the direction of one of the spins, uh, two of the other spins actually bend a little bit because of this term, because of delta. So this bending angle is given by delta. And uh, the correction to the energy uh, goes quadratically with delta. Yeah? So for small deltas, it will be a small correction, let's say. Okay, on, on the other hand, uh, if you look at the quantum mechanical, from the quantum mechanical point of view, let's say we uh, go to spin one halves, uh, it turns out that some of the con configurations have so-called interchangeable pairs, which means that, uh, so this is a pair of spins which are antiferromagnetically oriented, but then if you, uh, uh, change them and the change the direction of both, both of them, which would happen due to this uh, H plus minus term, right? So you're just uh, changing the orientation of both spins at the same time. What happens is if you have this alternating arrangement of the neighboring spin, spins around them, yeah, the energy again doesn't change. Meaning if you do a, a linear combination of such, uh, uh, such, uh, such states, yeah, this would be the eigenstate of the full Hamiltonian, yeah? Meaning that your correction to energy has to be uh, linear in delta, okay? So at small deltas, of course, linear correction is better than a quadratic correction, okay? So uh, from this point of view, this should really be a ground state, yeah? Um, it turns out that the total uh, momentum should go zero, uh, should go to zero. In the case of the classical state, it is, uh, at least in the limit where delta goes to zero, it's given by S over three. Uh, and uh, it turns out also that there are no uh, fixed spins. So it's a spin liquid again, and this time it's uh, a quantum spin liquid because you have this quantum corrections, right? H plus minus term. Okay, so these were initial predictions, but then it turned out that if you do a quasi-classical spin wave analysis, it turns out that uh, there is an extra Goldstone mode which is not related to this trivial um, uh, the degeneracy of the model uh, due to the rotational symmetry around the z-axis. So there is additional uh, degeneracy, which is non-trivial, and uh, what the additional, uh, these quantum terms do is that they remove the degeneracy and lead to the extra Goldstone mode, and as a consequence of that, the energy of such a state is actually again linear in delta. And the, uh, the size of the spin goes to zero. And so qualitatively, these two results now, so the like uh, ordered state and the quantum mechanical disorder state uh, are uh, qualitatively very similar. Yeah? And so there is a question, uh, of course, there's, uh, this means that there's strong tendency towards uh, long range order uh, in this model. And there is a question, uh, can maybe quantum spin liquid survive in some search, certain range, uh, uh, regions of the phase diagram? So for some specific uh, deltas, let's say, that's the question to answer. 
Okay, so now where should one look for such uh, strongly magnetically anisotropic systems? Well, the answer uh, is uh, in rare earths, in rare earth magnets. Why? Uh, we've heard a nice introduction to this uh, magnets yesterday by Bruce Golin uh, for the case of pyrochlores. So he, he explained to us that uh, the spin orbit coupling is here the biggest interaction uh, compared to the crystal field and the exchange coupling in the systems, which means that you're working with spin orbit and tangle states. So what one has to do is to uh, basically entangle the orbital and the spin momentum. Yeah, for the case of the neodymium, uh, which I will be showing later on, uh, the experimental case, this means that you are working with three, uh, three f electrons. Yeah, so uh, for, according to Hund's rule, rules, this would uh, the orbital state would be uh, L equals six because uh, it has to be maximized, and the, uh, the same goes for the spin state. It's spin uh, S equals three halves. But now the spin orbit coupling, what it does is, of course, that it entangles. Uh, uh, these two degrees of freedom, and it leads to spin orbital uh, 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 manifolds, right? In the case of uh, neodymium 3 plus, the ground state turns out to be this 4i 9 half state, which means that the total momentum is 9 halves. Yeah? So you basically subtract the orbital and the spin momentum, uh, which means that there, is, uh, there are uh, 10. 2j plus, 2j plus 1, right? 10 uh, different states, which are degenerated. Now, when you put uh, your ion now in the crystal field, in crystal, yeah? So there is a crystal field, which is the next uh, perturbation. And what crystal field does is that it splits these levels. Yeah? And since we are working with uh, half integer spins, uh, the final splitting has to lead to doublets. It cannot give you any singlets. Yeah? So you end up with, with doublets, and the final ground state is so-called Kramer's doublet ground state, which is then separated from excited doublets. Yeah? And uh, so if you are at temperature which are uh, low compared to this energy splitting, the crystal field splitting gap, then you are effectively working, of course, with uh, effective spin one half degrees of freedom. Uh, now the magnetic uh, property of the ground state is usually highly anisotropic. This comes sort of from the fact, actually, that uh, the crystal field is anisotropic. It breaks the rotational symmetry. And this, since you have an entangled state with the spin, uh, you end up with uh, anisotropic effective spin at the end. And uh, you can obtain uh, the ground state uh, moment momentum by simply uh, uh, projecting your total spin on, onto the ground state. And this gives you some typical G factors. You can end up with Eisenklike anisotropy so that you have dominant uh, magnetic anisotropy along one direction, or XY-like, uh, where you have uh, like uh, plane-like anisotropy, which is dominant. Uh, now, the next uh, interaction or the next uh, perturbation is then the interaction between spins, the spin-spin uh, interaction. This is usually much smaller than the crystal field uh, splitting, and it's usually of the order of a Kelvin or, or so for rare earths. And this is due to the fact that um, the orbitals are really um, they're not extended in space a lot. They have this uh, high f orbitals. So typical exchange uh, uh, parameters are of the order of a Kelvin. It can be up to maybe 10 Kelvins, but it can also be much lower than a Kelvin. Uh, yeah, so now again, uh, to get the interaction between spins, one has to project the interaction between the spin orbital degrees of freedom again onto the ground state. And since we are dealing with spin one half degrees of freedom, uh, one, fi one finally ends up with a Hamiltonian like that. So you have a, a bilinear uh, interaction, and there is a uh, uh, interaction uh, tensor, yeah, which is constrained by lattice symmetry. Uh, in our case, we'll be dealing with triangular lattice. Uh, in, in this case, in addition to the Ising and the plus minus Hamiltonian, which I was uh, talking about before, so this is H. Uh, X, X, Z Hamiltonian, you can also have this bond dependent terms, which we heard about this morning in case of the, uh, of the Kitayev model, right? And in principle, all this term can be of equal uh, size. Yeah? All can be important. Okay, why is, this why is this interesting? Because all these terms give you really rich phase diagrams. This is a case for, for uh, a triangular lattice with different uh, couplings, including the plus, minus, plus, minus. So these are these bond dependent terms at, and Z plus minus terms. And you, you see that the majority of the phase diagram is occupied by uh, various uh, ordered states, but there are also regions where you can expect spin liquids to occur. 
I should emphasize that all this work that has been done recently actually focused on uh, the limit where, where delta is bigger than one. And this is simply due to the fact that the most uh, famous representative of, of this triangular lattice with a spin liquid like ground state is uh, ytterbium magnesium gallium oxide, which is uh, found in this, uh, uh, which has delta bigger than one. On the other hand, for delta smaller than one, than one or for really small deltas, there is really no uh, in-depth studies that would be performed so far. Okay, so let's move now to our case. So, so this is the neodymium uh, heptatantalate, as I said before. So first, uh, crystal structure was determined by combining XRD and neutron powder diffraction. So this is high temperatures, this is low temperatures, 40 millik. Yeah, so we combine these two. Uh, and uh, the resulting uh, uh, conclusions are the following. So there is a really small amount of some residual non-magnetic tantalum oxide, which is used in the synthesis. Yeah? So this is uh, not important for, for the magnetic properties, of course. There is no non-stoichiometry present in the system, so all the lattice sites are fully occupied, including oxygen, so there is no oxygen vacancies. Uh, there is no uh, intersite mixing. Yeah? And there is also no structural change between high and low temperatures. So the, both uh, uh, neutron powder refraction and also XRD uh, can be expanded within or refined within the same space group. Space group. Uh, this is the corresponding uh, crystal structure. So we have layers. You see, it's a layered material. And within these layers, you have a triangular lattice of neodymium 3 plus ions, which is perfect in the sense that there is only one magnetic site. So all the interactions have the, should have the same value. So there is only one, let's say it like that. Uh, now from the uh, interaction point of view, what is important is of course the distance between ions. The, the distance between, uh, in the layers is uh, six point something angstrom. And the exchange bridge actually goes through, as you can see here, through oxygen, then tantalum and oxygen ba and back to, to neodymium. In the case of the interlayer coupling here, the exchange bridges are much more complicated. So it, it, this includes two tantalum sites. And also the distance is increased, meaning that we should expect that uh, the interactions within the layers should be, uh, should be dominant compared to the interlayer interactions. So we, we should be dealing really with a, a two-dimensional case. OK, so let's look at the magnetism of the, of the system. Uh, so first, routinely, one measures, of course, magnetic susceptibility. There is nothing much happening in terms of the, yes, please. Yeah. Go back. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so this is a unicell, exactly, yeah. So this is a unicell, but this is just given by the symmetry. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, so the up-pointing triangles looks differently from the down I, You mean here? Yes. Yeah, so this is the unicell. Right, so it means that the, you have the one... symmetry is not C6. It doesn't have the six-fold rotation. Uh, no, no, it has uh, uh, C3, so it's... Um, uh, how is it called? Uh, the screw axis. Right, and inversion symmetry is broken. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the uh, magnetic properties first, uh, if you uh, fit the high temperature uh, part of magnetic susceptibility to a Curie Weiss law, you get a rather large Curie Weiss parameter. Uh, but this is actually not as, again, we've heard about yesterday from Bruce Gollin. This is not really a uh, signature of the size of the interactions in your system because it's due to this uh, uh, Van Vleck uh, contribution. It, it, it accounts to changing population of the crystal uh, levels with, with uh, energy. This is why it bends here. So if one wants to really determine the interactions between the spins, one has to focus on really low temperatures and yeah, this part here. And what I show here is uh, actually a uh, thorough analysis of the uh, 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 Curie-Weiss uh, uh, parameter uh, theta, the Curie-Weiss temperature, as a function of the uh, lower and the upper limit of the fitting range. As what we can see here is that, so this is uh, the maximal temperature, so this is this one. So the upper level of the fitting range actually affects a lot the Curie-Weiss temperature, but not below something like 4.5 K. 
at 4.5k, you get something that really corresponds to the ground state. If you do your feet at to higher temperatures, you effectively basically also include starts including the uh, higher crystal electric field corrections, and this gives you some distortion to the to the uh, to this parameter. So it's not a true property of the ground state. But if you go, if you limit uh, to the low temperatures, it's okay. And on the other hand, the lower uh, limit of, of uh, this fitting range, you can see that it does not really, it gives you the same limiting value. It does not affect the fit, which means that the correlations are not big enough to affect your fit. And this is in line uh, with the fact actually that we are fitting only uh, down to 2K and our uh, Curie Weiss temperature, which we get out is of the order of only uh, 0.5, let's say. Okay, so, so it's much lower. Okay, so this is now the uh, effective interaction that we have in the ground state. And uh, since, uh, as I said before, the crystal electric field uh, uh, inter uh, interactions will be dominant, this interaction or this uh, states will dominate the magnetic response of the system. So it's important to re really properly determine uh, the levels. So what I'm showing here is a comparison between the magnetic so this is our neodymium heptatantalate to non-magnetic lantanium heptatantalate, which has the same crystal structure. So here I have two different temperatures for the neodymium case and here for the lanthanum case yeah, at, at the same temperature. Okay, so uh, first glance at this picture, of course, tells you there, there is dominant uh, signal at large Qs. Yeah, and this is dispersive. You, you get these arcs in your uh, data, so it's dispersive and it's due to phonons. Uh, and uh, phonons typically have increasing uh, signal with increasing temperature. So if you compare these two, you see the signal increases here and also here increases if you increase the temperature. And also it increases typically with Q. So this is perfectly in line with phonons, right? Uh, then in addition to that, you have very weak scattering, uh, which are these flat modes here. So these are denoted by two arrows. Yeah, you can see here. So these flat modes, uh, additional modes, which uh, on the other hand decrease with temperature. Yeah, so if you increase the temperature, the intensity goes down, and you don't see them in the non magnetic case, yeah, the lanthanum uh, compound, and also they decrease with Q. And this is something that's uh, typical for crystal electric field uh, uh, transitions. Uh, yeah, so to uh, um, see it better, actually, uh, see better these two non dispersive uh, modes. Non dispersive actually means that it's single ion property, of course. Uh, so one can uh, basically subtract the two data sets, the neodymium and, and lantern data sets, and one ends up with uh, these flat modes, as I said before. So two flat modes are observed here. Actually, if one increases the initial energy of the neutrons, there is additional mode here, which is not very clearly visible, but on this uh, plot here where we integrated over a certain range of Qs, there is a clear peak you see in the magnetic uh, compound, which is not seen in the non-magnetic one. So there is a third uh, uh, crystal electric field mode. So we observe three different flat modes. And uh, this is now the integrated uh, data uh, over Qs, a certain uh, range of Qs. So these are these modes, this mode here, the second, the higher modes here, and the highest mode is this one, okay? And uh, these two modes, the lower energy and the highest energy mode, they have all the width which corresponds to experimental uh, instrumental resolution, sorry, while the, this mode here is broader than that. Okay, why is it broader? Let's try to understand that. So we basically fitted with the crystal electric field model, which means that we included the Stevens operator, which, uh, which are in line with the point uh, symmetry of the neodymium side, uh, all possible ones. Uh, and uh, we fitted simultaneously the inelastic Newton scattering, yeah, this, so this curve, plus the magnetic response of the system. So the susceptibility and the magnetization versus the magnetic field. Yeah? And so these are the fits, the, the full lines are the fits with this model and the corresponding uh, result of our energy levels are, are the following. So we have one mode, the lowest excitation, which is at approximately 10 or, or nine MeV. Then we have another one, actually two of them, which are pretty close together. This is why we don't resolve the two peaks here, and then we have the highest mode, which is here. And uh, since we are, we have uh, five different uh, Kramer's uh, doublets, right? Because it's nine half spins, as I said before, uh, these are all the crystal electric field excitations that, that you can have, yeah? So you can uh, see, of course, four transitions from the ground state. And this is then the corresponding parameters and the ground state, the eigenvalues. 
So for instance, the ground state, this is uh, this um, omega zero, is mainly uh, given by five half uh, state, as you can see here. There is a small contribution also of the one half state and seven half state, but this is really the dominant contribution. Now one can uh, then uh, uh, calculate, of course, the, what is the magnetic anisotropy, single ion anisotropy in the ground state, and it turns out to be of the Ising character, meaning the, uh, the, the G factor along the Z direction is uh, dominant, it's much bigger than within the uh, X, Y direction, so within the, uh, the triangular plane. Uh, so it's Ising character. And this is also something that we observed uh, from uh, ESR directly. The, the G factors are confirmed by ESR. Okay, now let's see where our interactions come in, right? So is there some discrepancy between the uh, crystal electric field and our measurements? Actually, it turns out that if you look at low enough temperatures, uh, there is discrepancy. So what I'm showing here is the difference between the measured magnetization as a function of field versus the crystal electric field model, the predicted one. And as you can see here, at 10K, you have your data sets which are scattered around zero. Yeah? So uh, the crystal electric field model is perfect, let's say there. But if you decrease the temperature down to 2K, you get this uh, systematic uh, discrepancy yeah, between the model and the measurements, which means that, uh, of course, spin correlations are, are uh, began, beginning to set in. And uh, the fact that we only see it at 2K actually corresponds well with the rather large uh, crystal, uh, sorry, the uh, crevice temperature, right? Okay, then um, trying to determine slightly better the, um, the, the interactions, yeah, the anisotropy in our system, uh, we performed also ESR. So ESR is a particularly uh, powerful technique for determining the magnetic anisotropy because the line width is given by the anisotropy. The uh, symmetric uh, exchange does not give you any line width. So if you have some anisotropy, it will give you finite line width. And on the other hand, it's also uh, affected by fluctuations, uh, spin fluctuations in your system. Uh, so what we observe is this uh, temperature dependence, so increasing line width with temperature, and you can fit it with this uh, formula given here. So there is a constant line width up to, let's say, 10K, and then the uh, line width starts increasing. The reason for that is uh, so-called Orbach scattering uh, process, which means that you have two phonon scattering pro uh, process through the intermediate uh, or uh, excited crystal electric field uh, uh, levels. And this actually causes spins to fluctuate because of fluctuations of the crystal field. You're, uh, you have this uh, uh, exponential dependence, yeah? so the phonon density increases with increasing temperature, and this gives you also exponentially increasing uh, fluctuation rate. And this enters directly into your line width here. So the extracted um, uh, energy gap from this uh, dependence is rather close to the one that is extracted from inelastic Newton scattering, although not, not exactly the same, I should stress. Okay, then uh, the second uh, information is uh, provided, as I said, by the uh, anisotropy itself, uh, the, uh, sorry, the line width itself, which gives you the anisotropy in your uh, crystal electric field ground state. And one can simply calculate, basically assuming some interaction to be dominant, one can calculate the second moment of this calculation and then correlate it to, uh, to, the, elect uh, to the ESR line width. For the case for the, of the dipolar, uh, interactions in this system because we are dealing dealing with quite small spins in the ground state and also they are quite far apart. Yeah? So it turns out that the dipole contribution to the SR line width is only of the order of 5 millitesla compared to uh, something like 500 millitesla. Right? So it's uh, two orders of magnitude smaller than the experiment. So the line width has to be due to exchange anisotropy and the simplest uh, model that you can do is you, that you start from isotropic uh, exchange between uh, spin orbital degrees of freedom. And then when you project this onto your ground state, it turns out that the anisotropy uh, uh, in the exchange is then uh, proportional to the square of, uh, of, the, of the G factor. Yeah? So for our Ising-like uh, case of single ion anisotropy, we also expect Ising-like uh, uh, exchange anisotropy yeah? for this simplest, of course, uh, uh, case. Yeah? And, uh, where we start with isotropic, as I said, uh, interaction between, uh, between the orbital, spin orbital degrees of freedom. Yeah, so we end up with this Hamiltonian, which we already seen before. Yeah, so we have the, uh, the uh, Z component plus the XY component. 
and so one can as, uh, calculate the second moment and estimate the corresponding exchange uh, constant. And what we get is actually that uh, the Z, the Ising exchange component is dominant, is something like uh, six times bigger than the in-plane uh, exchange. Yeah? So we have Ising-like, we should have an Ising-like antiferromagnet. And also the corresponding Kirillized temperature, if you just average this data set, you get something which is close to the, this value, uh, not exactly the same again, but close to the value that we determined from the bulk measurement. Okay, so now let's go to low temperatures to see what is the magnetic ground state of the system, right? So what we performed first was powder Newton diffraction. So here is a comparison of the 10K and 40 milli K data. So in the case of long range magnetic order, you would expect as Bella Lake explained to us nicely, uh, you would expect uh, some additional Bragg peaks due to order. Yeah? And nothing like this is observed in this case, even at 40 milli K. So here, what you can see is the difference between the two signals. So you don't have any uh, sharp Bragg peaks. Uh, you have some distortion of the signal, but this is simply due to the fact that your uh, nuclear Bragg peaks uh, slightly change with temperature because of the change of the lattice parameters, of course. Uh, so there are no uh, additional Bragg peaks. And the position where you would expect it based on the size of your lattice is somewhere here, around 0 0.5 inverse angstroms. We also performed polarized neutron experiment uh, in which you can uh, effectively basically separate between the nuclear uh, contribution, nuclear um, uh, scattering, the incoherent and the magnetic scattering. And the magnetic signal is this blue one given here. So again, you see there's, there are no black peaks. If I uh, expand a little bit this magnetic signal. It is shown now here in this uh, figure. Uh, and uh, you can see that, of course, the signal is not zero. What we observe is diffuse scattering. Yeah? And diffuse scattering is something that you should observe even at, uh, in the paramagnetic state. So this is the formula for the uh, uh, cross-section uh, uh, due to the, uh, diffuse magnetic scattering. And there are two terms. There is the first term, which is due to self-correlations. So this should be constant. So the only Q dependence comes from the magnetic form factor of your magnetic moment. And this is monotonic function. Okay? It's slowly decaying monotonic function. On the other hand, if you have spin-spin uh, correlations, it will give you this C of Q uh, term, which is then uh, has some periodicity. And the periodicity should de or depends on the uh, correlation length that you have in your, in your system. Okay, so let's focus now on the two uh, uh, signals that we have. So this is five Kelvin signal. At five Kelvin signal, this uh, curve that is shown here, it's simply a paramagnetic curve. So we uh, just put C to zero and uh, take the experimental value of the G factor, aver average it, uh, of course, because we are dealing with uh, powder samples and with no free parameters, actually there are no free parameters. Everything is fixed here, you get this curve. Yeah? And this curve nicely corresponds, right, to the, to the experiment. Okay, so this is 5K. Then you decrease the temperature. What you observe is that the signal slightly increases. Yeah, it goes up and there is this modulation, you see, that appears. Okay, maybe it's not so clear yet, but if you put a curve over it, yeah, so this curve now corresponds to the model where uh, there are uh, Ising uh, correlations between nearest neighbors perpendicular uh, to the Ising axis. So you have your axis along the C direction and then you have correlations within the layers. And this curve here is an analytical formula that you can work out uh, for such a case. And again, uh, the periodicity yeah, of this curve is now determined by the distance between the spins. So this is this R parameter here that enters the equation. And you can see that periodicity ni nicely matches the nearest neighbor's distance that there is in our system. And in addition to that, uh, the amplitude uh, or yeah, the amplitude of the oscillation is given by the um, uh, correlation by, by the correlations, uh, how, how, many, how much of correlations there, there are between the nearest neighbors. And uh, fitting this data set, we get approximately one third for this uh, uh, expression here. And I should emphasize that the maximum would be two thirds. So the correlations are pretty high here. Okay. So then we did another analysis of this uh, low temperature data set by reverse Monte Carlo refinements. Yeah, and uh, these refinements included uh, either one-dimensional or, or three-dimensional spins, meaning either Ising spins or, or in principle, Heisenberg spins, right? So for the one-dimensional case, we get this uh, uh, dashed curve, you see, which exactly matches the analytical expression, meaning that your correlations are really um, uh, developing in the uh, perpendicular direction to the anisotropy axis. 
because otherwise, if it was the other way around, uh, the formula is different. Okay. Now, if we allow our spins to be th uh, three-dimensional, uh, the uh, the fit is now this blue dash curve here. You see that the agreement with the data set uh, gets better, especially at lower Q values. And But what we extract is actually that the dominant spin interactions are still along the icing axis. Yeah? So the, this, um, sorry, correlations, I should say. The dominant correlations are still along the icing axis. So this value here doesn't change much uh, compared to this simpler model, but you gain additional correlations uh, in the other two components of the spin, yeah? X and Y components. Okay, so uh, uh, in, indeed, yeah, these correlations that are dominant uh, in the Z direction uh, tell you that uh, the exchange Hamiltonian that we extracted from the ESR uh, is at least uh, as the first approximation, a good approximation. Okay, so uh, I should move to, yeah, I'm Okay, I'm uh, almost finished. So I should move only to uh, some local probe inside that we also performed. So we did uh, MIOSAR measurements. Uh, these are the corresponding MIOSAR relaxation curves. I should only say that the, uh, the fact that they decay monotonically down to zero means that you have fluctuating local fields. Yeah? So there are no static magnetism, also conferred by MIOSAR. Um, and the relaxation rate here, again, has this huge temperature dependence, which is due, mainly due to the, again, to the orbit process. We get the same uh, splitting as from ESR, uh, while the relaxation rate at the, this uh, value that you get at uh, low temperatures is due, of course, to the uh, crystal electric field ground state. And it turns out that uh, one is in the so-called fast, fast fluctuation limit, which means that the fluctuations are fast compared to the uh, 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 precession frequency in the local fields caused by the uh, by the magnetic moments on the on the uh, muon side. Okay, so the final picture is like that. So we have, uh, as I said, um, uh, perfect triangular lattice of Ising-like spins that, that are correlating along the z direction preferentially, and uh, they are also fluctuating still. Yeah? And so let me just summarize and give you a, a small outlook. Uh, so, the, again, the uh, uh, neodymium heptatantalate, which I have presented to you, uh, turns out to be an Ising uh, single ion, has Ising single ion anisotropy. Yeah, so, from the single ion point of view, it's an Ising magnet. Uh, there is no magnetic order observed down to the lowest possible uh, experimentally accessible temperatures. But there, are, um, there is diffuse scattering, which gives you an idea of the Ising-like uh, antiferromagnetic correlations within the planes. Yeah? And uh, there is also persistent dynamics. So the outlook, uh, to, to wrap it up, uh, would be to focus next to, on single crystals. I should say, I didn't stress this before, that all the measurements that I've presented so far were done on powders. Yeah? Now we succeeded in growing some rather tiny steel single crystals, which are of the size like, uh, what is this, two times three millimeters, but that's already quite nice. And the first idea, of course, would be to refine the spin Hamiltonian of the system. Then the second idea would be to, uh, uh, to get some theoretician to work out the phase diagram uh, slightly more precisely, because as I said before, this is missing, especially in the Ising-like region of the phase diagram. Uh, there's not much known. And uh, the last point that I should emphasize is that this neodymium heptatantalate is a member of a large, actually, family of tantalates, of, of heptatantalates. So, as with pyrochlores, you can easily change their air earth for something else, and you might uh, end up with something which acts completely different from the magnetic point of view. And uh, the system that we are focusing now on, one of them is the erbium case. Uh, we don't, I should stress, we don't know anything yet about its ground state, whether it orders or not, about the magnetic interactions, nothing like this. But what we do know is that the interactions between spins seems to be increased by a factor of two approximately compared to the neodymium case. So with this, I would like to conclude and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Andre, for a very nice talk. Okay. Question? Yes, first Pratya, then Carlo. Once you know your crystal field Hamiltonian, you can estimate the G tensor, right? Yes, for the ground. Does that match your experiments? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Well, uh, within the experimental error bars, of course. This is, maybe I was quick on that. Uh, okay, let me... 
find it. Uh, yes. So this was that. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the experimental values that you get, and uh, this is this is the modeling basically. Okay. So yeah? okay. So you. Oh, you already have an overlap of GX and GY in yes. yeah. the ground state. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I should stress that the, the G factor is really very strongly dependent on, on the on these parameters of the crystal electric field parameters. So this agreement, like, okay, we, we say here 2.8, let's say, and we get 2.5, means that it's quite good. Right, so the interaction between the spins is quite small. Yes. So if you look at a single triangle, how much do you think, how, I mean this one to two, I mean like one up to down yeah. or vice versa, yeah. how yeah. much is it satisfied? Yeah, so as I said, the correlation is, uh, let me go to that value. Uh, so this is this. Yeah, so it, if it would be 100% uh, satisfied, then this expression, sorry, ah, this expression here, you see, so Z is now the uh, number of nearest neighbors, time uh, the correlation between the sides, and then divided by S uh, times S plus one. So this is uh, three quarters, this is one quarter, minus one quarter, maximally, right? So you have uh, six times uh, one third, okay? Yeah, so, uh, and then you have to, of course, to average over the triangle. So the maximum value that you get is then minus two thirds. That would be like 100% correlated on, on the local scale. And what we get experimentally is half of that, approximately, slightly more than half of that. And, and do you think you can get anything from specific heat? I think it's very diff difficult, but maybe yes. entropy or? Uh, we tried with specific heat, but haven't uh, really managed to get really nice data yet. The problem is that everything uh, occurs with really low temperatures and there are problems with measuring actually such uh, conditions because of the relaxation rates which get really, really uh, long. Okay, Frederick, you can ask a question. I see yes. you. Yeah. I, first of all, I would like to say I, I cannot open my video. I don't know why I'm blocked, but it doesn't matter. I, I, I had actually a question about the specific heat, but let me start with a, a comment. You quoted the results by one year, you know, for the uh, residual yeah, yeah. entropy. It, yeah. It's remarkable. This result is wrong. Yeah. It's, about about what you mean? Well, the, the number. Vanier uh, the, made a mistake in estimating the integral. The whole calculation is absolutely correct. The integral is correct, but the numerical number in Vanier, if you go to the previous slide, is, is, is wrong. And actually, he noticed it himself and wrote a comment. So in, in case you were you mean the entropy, right? Yeah, the entropy, yeah. and it's it's a second digit. So I mean, it, it's small, but still, I mean, if you were to try to fit the missing entropy, the yeah, entropy okay. of the triangle lattice is not zero point three three eight three, but zero point three two three zero, etc. And <laughs> when you it, it's amazing because this is an extremely well cited paper, yeah, yeah. and and the main result already written in the abstract is incorrect, and there is no way to correct this apart from. In well, our case, uh, I think we are not really exactly in this the Ising limit, you know, because we clearly observe the, the um, correlations also in the perpendicular directions, which means that you need to have also additional interactions, right? That, so that, it's, that, then that it's a, yeah, then you of course uh, um, lose some of the states in, in the ground states, so the entropy should be decreased already because of that, right? But but you de you did not uh, measure any missing entropy, did you? No, we or didn't. No, we didn't did manage yet to measure the specific heat. No, unfortunately, okay. no. The, the missing entropy for this correlation. Okay, thank you. Fabrice, Fabrice, yes. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Andre. Uh, maybe one just short question about uh, the MUSR plateau. Yeah. Uh, could you manage to extract some value for the fluctuation frequency yes. and some J related yes. to that? Yeah, yeah so this I, is, I was also fast here, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so these are the values here. So the local field is of um, reasonable value, like 120 goals. Yeah something uh, I would say reasonable, uh, but the fluctuation frequency is small here. 
we measured this at the base temperature at this decoupling. And uh, so this might be the reason that we are actually observing so, some uh, uh, like correlated spin cor uh, excitations that are not, these are not uh, paramagnetic excitations probably. And the other uh, problem in this uh, uh, case is also that the field uh, where you basically, the frequency determines, uh, is determined mostly by this point, the highest field point, right? And uh, this uh, field value is already approaching, let's say, the J's. So this might also, of course, um, affect the results, right? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Juan Kamode. You, you can take this mic or you have one, okay. This. Uh, I have uh, like two questions. Uh, one is, uh, is there any relation between low temperature theta CW value and uh, crystal electric field gap? Like uh, if you take uh, YBMG GAO4 case, the low temperature theta CW is about uh, minus four Kelvin. Yeah. And uh, delta C of uh, crystal electric field gap is about uh, uh, like a 40, about to 40 milli electron volt. In this case, uh, in your compound, it is a 0.4 Kelvin minus, and uh, delta C of is equal to uh, like 9.5 milli electron volt. Is there like a, is there any relation like uh, theta C W is increases like uh, uh, crystal electric field gap increases such kind of thing? So if I understand you correctly, you're asking whether this value here is related to the crystal electric field. Yeah, yeah, that is that's I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. It increases. Yeah. I mean, if if you include the high temperatures, right, where you are populating your excited states. I, I am I am I am comparing with uh, like a, a previous uh, like uh, existing YB based compounds. With what I mean. Correct me. What he is asking whether in such compounds, yeah. theta C W has some direct correlation with the crystal field uh, values. Yeah, it has. You have to go to low enough temperatures to really get the theta, uh, the, the theta value of the ground state. And this is what we did with this analysis here. So we varied the interval, the fitting interval, and uh, basically uh, what we uh, are showing here is the dependence of the uh, of the theta on the uh, on the uh, uh, interval fitting interval yeah and if you you are mad, if you include points in our case at least if you include points which are above 4.5k you, you start affecting theta a lot yeah so you immediately go from 0 46 let's say yeah to double the value already if you include uh, data sets up to only like six kelvins or something like that so you should be careful about that yeah, and in our case, yeah, the, our uh, crystal electric field is 10 uh, milli electron volts, which means like 100 kelvins, right? Plus something. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Another question. Uh, yeah, like uh, if you uh, you are saying it is icing spin uh, kind of thing, then if you grow the single crystals of the same system, uh, do we see like a, a magnetization m versus h graph? In the direction of uh, c axis is very high we should uh, we haven't measured that yet but yeah we expect this to happen of course, okay yeah. so, so the magnetization should be really and uh, and uh, moreover that uh, recently there are pe uh, people looking at uh, erbium based uh, triangular lattice also uh, triangular lattice yeah. erbium based er okay yeah. Uh, yeah. so uh, when i look at the literature survey there are many compounds uh, till it uh, exists yeah. some of them are mostly like a uh, uh, so, uh, some of them are uh, not showing any ordering at low temperature, yeah. but a few are showing like a stripe, man, uh, stripe type antiferromagnetic ordering. So what you expect, uh, like, uh, of course, uh, you are do in your uh, graph for Airbnb three place, it is not ordered or what? So the, uh, yeah, ethereum, uh, ethereum sorry, uh, case we also have, yeah, so it's here. Uh, but so far, we don't really have uh, much data on this. We only have the basic bulk, bulk characterization. And okay. As I said before, uh, the Curie-Weiss constant is increased here, yeah, but we don't know what will happen at low temperatures, whether it will order or not. And also, what is the anisotropy, really? If it's still Eisenklike, or maybe it's X1. Okay. 
So, any other question? So, if not, let us thank Andre for a very nice talk and conclude this uh, session.